All right. Well, welcome to Prefab for All. Before we get started, a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Reem. Heat pump water heaters are the future. They take natural heat out of the air and use it to heat water with zero emissions directly up to 400% efficiency. Reem offers hybrid water heaters with backup electric resistance uh, at 240 volts to ensure water, uh, hot water all the time, or they have 120 volt systems that quickly replace a gas system without the expense of electrical upgrades. These work by pulling heated air through a filter that is absorbed with an R410 refrigerant using a compressor to heat the coils wrapped around the tank. You can control your system's heating levels, sense leak detection, track energy use over time, and set it up for a time of use program. This is how I use it, right? Occupants uh, can program this tech to heat water when electric rates are low, like for me from two to seven. Uh, and then uh, during off peak hours, utility programs are coming out all over the country and the world to use these systems like a battery uh, and incentivize different behaviors. You can see this uh, analysis from NRDC <laughs> depicts these types of particular behavior. IRA benefits up to $2,000 tax credits for these Ream heat pump water heaters and up to 600 for the electric system improvements needed. Heat pump water heaters, ream.com, go and check it out. And also thanks to our second tier sponsors, Entertech and Water Furnace, Geothermal, it's the most energy efficient also known as ground source heat pumps. We're talking 30% tax deduction, non-refundable through the Inflation Reduction Act. I receive similar tax credits for solar. If I can do it, you might be able to do it too. Consult with your tax consultant and check it out uh, when you're doing your next project. All right, well, welcome to, again, Prefab for All. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier, and more sustainable choices. Today, I'll be your moderator, and I'm the education manager here, Brett Little. This course is approved for multiple continuing education units, as well as all five pillars of green under our certified green home professional designation. It has been submitted for AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. So with that, I am going to hand it off to Sherry, our speaker today, and welcome back, Sherry. I think this is now the third, maybe fourth time you've been on the show, kind of lost count. It's been quite a while. So it's good to have you back. <laughs> and you, um, yeah, and, and good to see you. And please, um, please take it away. Okay. Well, I wish we had a more uh, technologically uh, sophisticated um, uh, presentation, but we'll do the best we can with what we have. One house that I wanted to show you is another interesting concept. It's um, because this house was built in a very remote area and difficult to access in Pioneer Town, California, um, this house was built with a metal frame, which is very easy to put together. Um, it's easy to transport and put together. And again, the architect, Jeremy Levine, um, worked with Blue, Blue Sky Building Systems who do these metal systems. And they, he also wanted to build this house as efficiently as possible uh, with lots of glazing, um, optimal solar orientation, um, large outdoor spaces, ceiling fans, cross ventilation, wraparound porches, a lot of daylighting and LED lighting. So um, this is used as a vacation house. I believe they also rent it out, but it was also so thoughtfully done. And I think that's what amazed me about all of the houses that I included in this book. They were just, um, all of them were done with great thoughtfulness, great um, interest in the environment and also in, um, in creating the most energy efficient houses that they were able to build. Um, so um, that's the end of that um, PowerPoint. Um, the, all of these pictures are from a, um, oh, there's a lot of outdoor space in that as well, which you can see in the, um, in the photos. Um, <clears throat> all, of, all of these pictures are from 
my upcoming book, which is coming out this week, Prefabulous for Everyone. And there's lots of examples of wonderful houses that were thoughtfully done and showing that you can live in a small house and still be quite comfortable and have a house that meets all of your all of your needs. Um, I appreciate all of you attending today. I'm sorry we're having some technical difficulties. I, I'm actually doing this on my phone, unfortunately. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for uh, sticking around. Um, and yeah, we do have a couple of questions. As we're getting to those questions, you'll probably all just kind of see me uh, scroll back through some of these uh, wonderful photos here, um, just for anyone who is joining late to kind of be able to just kind of see them um, just as we're talking. Uh, and maybe there might be a couple that some folks wanted to reference with some specific uh, with some specific uh, questions. I see here. that somebody was asking me about uh, some of the resources. And for those yep. of you that are familiar with my books, at the back of every every one of my books, I have a resource list for every one of the houses and they show some of the systems and uh, they, besides showing the architect and the builder, they show a lot of the um, resources that people used uh, to build the house. And so I hope that's helpful for people that are thinking about building their own houses. Yeah, great. Thanks. So it looks like uh you'll be able to find that list of supplies they're asking about um, in that place. So another question that came up was about embodied carbon. It's becoming very important. Um, we see that now the Department of Energy through the, well, through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the federal government must um, look at embodied carbon in the construction, I believe, of federal buildings. Uh, mm -hmm. And the DOE is looking at partners to put together embodied carbon uh, evaluations, um, you know, uh, nationally. The SEC is looking at it for, I think, um, uh, ESG reporting. And then we've just got a huge awareness around it through a lot of nonprofit partners like Builders um, for Clean Action out of Canada and Rocky Mountain Institute. Green Home Institute requires embodied carbon evaluations in our Green Star program. So, Long story short, embodied carbon, for those of you who don't know, think energy modeling, but for the materials going in and how much carbon they're using during the construction. So the question to you, Sherry, and I was setting all that up for anyone who's like, wait, what's embodied carbon, uh, is do you know or have you profiled any homes that have thought through the embodied carbon, you know, when you were talking to folks in, in, in these yeah. homes? I think that all of the... Um... All of the architects that I'm working with are all um, very energy and sustainability conscious. And so I believe that they they have all been conscious of mm -hmm. this. And I have not uh, listed that information necessarily um, for each house. But I believe that the architects that I'm working mm -hmm. with are very conscious of of uh, their use of materials and and embodied carbon. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so on that note, there was a very specific question of um, comparing the carbon footprint between panelized construction versus modular. Is that something, you know, again, uh, that you got into? Obviously, this is more specifically sort of on giving us a taste of all the different projects that are coming out but i just wanted to get to this person's specific question again if if there's been any conversations that you've seen or had with uh you know just panelization versus versus modular um no <laughs> i haven't, haven't heard that uh conversation i can tell you that both of them are using are using less uh, materials than yeah. I can tell you than from a um, a site built house. Um, uh, materials are cut offs from one house or used for another. And so there's a lot less um, a lot less waste. Mm -hmm. And um, for all of the 
prefab methods that I've covered, they're all um, preserving um, uh, materials and mm. they're better for the environment. Um, and I just wanted to point out like of this home I landed on here using insulated concrete forms, you know, fantastic for um, storm resistance, but concrete in and of itself is a is our number one emitting carbon source um, uh, from material materiality standpoint. So uh, mm -hmm. I do know they're coming out with new ICFs or new carbon in, or new concrete anyway that uh, has less carbon in it. Um, but anyway, mm -hmm. that's just one thing to point out. Uh, well, there's, there's one of the things. So. <laughs> yeah, one of the things to think about is when you're in an area where there's um, natural disasters, I mean, mm -hmm. you having to rebuild things several times is definitely mm -hmm. not good for the environment. So right, right. <laughs> in those cases, um, the, the last house that was there was totally destroyed and a great waste of materials. And so the hope is that using the concrete will, um, will avoid having to do that again. Also with the, um, ICF, the, uh, the, um, there, there's the, um, the forms that create a lot of insulation. So right. it also is in that way, it's good for the environment because there's less uh, energy that's used for heating and cooling that house. Mm -hmm. um, now on the question of modular, someone was just, you know, uh, expressing their concerns about trying to work with modular in the United States, uh, having issues with limited factories and struggles, struggles with contractors, understanding the process. So again, you know, when you went out and profiled these homes, um, you know, what are you hearing out there as far as the, the challenges for modular? Right. I've been writing about prefab houses for almost 20 years. And yeah. there's always um, people that will um, bring up issues. But mm -hmm. from my experience, um, there are lots of um, modular manufacturers around the country. Um, and for the most part, they're faster mm -hmm. and um, less mm -hmm. expensive to build. Um, mm -hmm. If you use a contractor mm -hmm. that is recommended by the by the factory, there should be less problems. I do have a friend who built a house here in Connecticut. She used somebody that I don't think was recommended by the factory. And he was not a builder. He just was a uh, salesman and he sold a house and that was not complete. And there were a million issues. So I think that in order to be successful with a any prefab, you need to make sure that before anything else, that the person that's going to be building it is qualified to put that house together and is a decent builder. But I think that's true with site-built houses too. You need to make sure that the person that's building your house is qualified and and um, will uh, know what he's doing. Yeah. So, I, I if I was building a house, I would never consider building anything but a prefab. There are so many. I mean, I could go on for mm. another hour talking about all the advantages of prefab over site built. But mm. um, I'm sure a lot, most of your viewers are exper have experience with this, and they probably know a lot of those advantages. Um, a question came up about. Uh, ADUs, and there's a lot of discussion in the chat about accessory dwelling units, um, mm -hmm. which is great. Uh, people do it, putting together exploratory committees and all that. So that's fantastic. Um, the question was, are there any good examples of cities who have gotten zoning codes changed to allow for more density? I assume part of that has to do with ADUs, but what have you seen out there at all? I've seen, um, well, let's see, um, in several areas in Texas, um, are uh, allowing ADUs. Um, Austin, uh, Austin and Houston, um, also Atlanta, um, Portland. Um, I believe that they're just beginning to allow some in Chicago. And one of the interesting things that's happening in some of the cities, 
this is an ongoing, very hot uh, top issue right now. Um, some of the cities are are asking architects to design houses that they will approve or obviously disapprove. But if they approve them, then homeowners can buy those plans and they do not have to go through a whole uh, zoning process, Mm. Um, not zoning, but approval process. So I know that there are several cities that are doing, are doing that. Um, And California was the first state to approve it universally throughout the state. And in some areas, they can do more than one ADU or have a junior ADU. Um, Also, I I believe um, uh, in Washington, D.C., they're allowing it. So little by little, it's hard to keep track because I keep um, a Google search on all of the uh, conversations about ADUs and every day there's another municipality that's requesting approval mm. for, um, for ADUs. So it, yeah. it's an ongoing, an ongoing hot topic. Yeah. And I've been seeing, uh, especially in the Pacific Northwest, significant changes to zoning um, that essentially um, spur more demand for alternatives to single family so Mm -hmm. um and i saw there was a uh, one of our members from the seattle had mentioned adus allowed everywhere so check out some of the cities out there for anyone if you're looking there's also i have um in this book um from i don't know how many people are familiar with the solar decathlon which is an event that's run by the department of energy Mm -hmm. and um in denver they built a house that was it Denver, Colorado? They built a house in a um, uh, these. Um, this couple um, offered to uh, support this effort by the university to build a house in an area that was uh, a ski area, and a lot of the local um, employees of seasonal employees were having trouble finding places to live. So they built a house for themselves with an included ADU, which was um, connected, which they rent out to people that are seasonal workers. And it was also built to very high standards and um, and it was well received by the Department of Energy. Yeah. Um, looking at this slide here, I brought up, there was a question on uh, if you knew what types of SIPs or structurally insulated panels um, were used. I'll be honest, I don't know. I know that there are such things as um, like cellulose sips um, from our good friends, um, Phoenix, who moved from Detroit to Colorado, but I haven't seen too many variations in sips. So anyway, have you, do you know what kind of specific sips were used on this? Um, I can look up and tell you what companies supplied the sips and each company has their own um, types of uh, sips that they they mm-hmm. use. But again, yeah. in the back of the book, I have a listing of all of the um, yeah. panels that were used and people can um, look up the uh, yeah. the particular SIPs and, and see if, you know, look on their websites and see what their, yeah. what their SIPs are made out of. We can just send uh, folks there. That's, that's just fine. Um, there was a great point, you know, the, the title here of the book, Prefabulous um, for Everyone, we updated it, Prefab for All, you know, we're starting to see, uh, you know, with housing shortages and costs, we kept talking about that. So the question here being, you know, have you seen any um, uh, supportive housing, such as, you know, transitional housing for homeless being able to build, be built more affordably this way uh, so it can help serve more people. Have you seen anything like that at all? I have. And I think there are several of the companies that I um, have looked into. There are, there are a number of affordable housing projects. I did not include any mm-hmm. of these projects in this particular book, but I know there are several companies, Connect Homes out in California is building some affordable housing <clears throat> And um, a lot of these companies are um, are trying to 
to build those with the support of uh, of the government. Mm -hmm. um, but I have not included some of them. I did mm -hmm. include afford some affordable housing to show that there are some that are available, but there's a lot of them and it would be impossible for me to include every single one of them in this book. Yeah, I think you had the HUD house at the beginning. So that was a I think part yeah, of it. Well, that, that ha there are several of the houses that are, um, are more affordable than your typical houses, particularly the one that I showed you that they put uh, three houses on a lot that would ordinarily have had one house and the Conexus house and the hut mm. and the, um, uh, the boxable are all mm. affordable, much more affordable housing. Mm. So yeah. I did try to, it's impossible to include everything in the book, but I did try to include a little bit of everything and, and give people an option to see who the people are that are doing these things so that they can look further into mm -hmm. um, some of the uh, types of houses that they're building, some of the ADUs that people are building. Mm -hmm. A question came up about homes being passive house certified. Obviously, this particular one I'm showing here up in Mm -hmm. uh, Vancouver, which I assumed is certified by the International Passive House Body. Um, right. are, there, are there any other examples you've seen that were specifically Passive House certified? Oh, yeah. I have another house in the book that's in Ulster County that is also a uh, Passive House. Uh -huh. um, it was designed by um, Demo Architects and um, it's called the Olive Passive House, and it's a beautiful house right upstate New York. So, yeah, there are other passive houses, and that one is uh, panelized. Mm -hmm. um, a specific question came in about geothermal, and they noted they didn't see, at least from what I, they could tell, a home that was using geothermal. Mostly, it seemed to be a shift to air source heat pumps. Is that typically what you're seeing as far as the heating side of things out there? I am. I haven't, I have not seen um, any of the houses that I've profiled or have geothermal um, heating. Um, and I'm sure it's a very good method. I believe it's, it's expensive and a lot of people are um, space uh, land space is, is uh, an issue. So I have not, and it's not that I don't think it's a good system. I look at, at hundreds of houses before I do these books. And what I try to find is houses that are mm. not only energy efficient um, and built in a sustainable way, but are also mm. attractive and houses that people might want to live in. So, um, and designed by architects who are, are very thoughtful and, um, and doing a good job in, um, in their designs. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, and as I was going through this, a question came up and it looks pretty consistent that every home that's employing um, mini splits is using uh, uh, an energy recovery ventilator um, or a heat recovery ventilator, probably to mm -hmm. move the air around, distribute the air appropriately through the house. Does that seem pretty consistent with what you're seeing? Yeah, actually, my I would say all of the houses that I include in my books are very, very energy efficient and very tight. And so whenever you have a very mm. uh, tight house uh, with no air exchange, people are putting energy recovery ventilators. I think that it's not necessarily the norm in a lot of houses in this country to have ERVs or HRVs, but um, the people that I'm covering, again, are much more energy conscious and and um, they're building tighter houses, and whenever you do that, they want their house, they want their houses to be he healthy. And having an ERV is is a healthy way. When I go out to speak, it's really interesting. It's it's some, I really believe in ERVs. I think they're great. And I just spoke recently at a library, and I asked people to raise their hand. How many people know what an ERV is? And and nobody knew from the general population. Yeah, it is, it is very, uh, it is a very unique uh, 
thing that's coming. So out. I mean, <laughs> the people that all that most of the houses that I cover do have ERVs, but in the general population, I'd say that it's probably a small percentage. People are more concerned about granite countertops than mm-hmm. necessarily having ERVs in the. Yeah. Um, well, before we wrap up, a real quick reminder to everyone, um, this session is being recorded and you can rewatch it, um, share it if you like on our YouTube channel. And as always, a huge thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, our nearly 300 members, our executive director, Jose Reina, and our top tier sponsors, um, Mitsubishi, Reem, April Air. They all have products along with all of our sponsors that are going to help you build greener and more sustainable housing um so sherry what do you what what's do you want to share you know you're always coming up with something great uh we always love (laughs) to have you on the show so uh anything that you want to share that you have coming up next um yeah i have another book that will be out next year on actually one of my favorite new topics at adus and with a beautiful collection of some of the uh, uh most efficient and diverse ADUs. Um, and meanwhile, Prefabulous for Everyone comes out mm-hmm. um, tomorrow, I believe. And so I hope some of you will go out and, and purchase it and will enjoy reading it. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, we are at our time, Sherry. I don't see any other questions here. Um, so I appreciate you, uh, even despite some of the hiccups we have. I thank you for sticking around with us. And I hope you all will go out and check out the book Prefabulous for All. And then uh, next year. For everyone. Uh, sorry, for everyone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the book. Yeah, don't look for Prefab for All. You won't find that. So Prefabulous for Everyone. Uh, mm-hmm. Sherry will uh, hopefully catch you uh, in 2024 for the next one. So <laughs> take care, everyone. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.